no role plays, just real. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. We've never really, as a workforce, spent a lot of time on making sure we're developing good leaders. We'll be able to share stories, experience, mistakes, uh, failures, successes. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And Lorenzo, on this episode, I want to start with a little something different here. You know, I was looking at something on LinkedIn a few days ago, and um, it was a, a video on leadership theories. And, you know, you know, I've talked about leadership theories a lot on this show. We've had episodes on the importance of, of having one or, or multiple ones, or at least knowing where the basis or the root of, of the way you lead comes from so that you can explore that. Um, we've talked about how, you know, we, we learn what we see, we, we learn from our mentors and our leaders positively, negatively, and that's how we kind of get to where we are currently as leaders. And I was, I was reading a, an article and watching a video on this, sent it to you, and you kind of replied back with this. It's funny, you know, funny you mentioned this, and, and you sent me a link to an article that you have um, shared with other leaders over the last few months. And, um, and I want to talk about the, the, the combination of those two. So what, t- talk about the article that you saw and you sent me. Yeah, so I was having some dialogue with a couple of leaders just from a development standpoint and, and realizing um, through just having questions and conversations that uh, you know, people are very aware of leadership theories and, and kind of how they lead. And, and you know, many times you hear things like, well, like I'm more of a servant leader or I empower my people sure. or like, like I, and I'm people development. And so like we tend sometimes to they don't the, even know what that means when they say it. it but exactly. Yeah, right. It sounds the good terms. Yeah, yeah. The terms that we throw around. Yeah. And um, and as I was digging deeper into that and I was like, oh, well, well, like what? Why that? Like, what is it about that type of leadership that kind of, you know, is something that you subscribe to or you believe in? And what you tend to find out is that people have found ways of leadership that either mentors or other leaders have shown them um, or they've picked up on little bits and pieces and things like that. But I was really saying like, well, like, do you, is there a theory that you subscribe to specifically or are you aware of different types of theories? And in some of the conversations, the answer was like, well, well, no, like, like I've read some books, I've seen some things, but not really. So um, I, I was online and, and as always looking for resources and things. And I came across uh, an article from monday.com uh, called A Complete Guide to Understanding and Implementing Leadership Theories. And I went through it, and I really enjoyed it. And as you mentioned earlier, I've shared this out quite a bit. And and the biggest reason is because they have a little thing on there where it says leadership is a way of thinking and behaving. Leadership means thinking long-term and big picture. And the context of leadership is vision, mission, and values. And I thought that it was it did a really nice job of comparing leadership and management um, but I, I've just kind of assigned it out to people. Said, "Hey, take a look at this. Tell me what you think. Are there anything in? Are there any theories in here that that you know resonate more with you or that you believe in? It can be a combination of many. But let's have some more conversation about this because I think one of the things that leaders should spend a lot of time doing, in my opinion, is that element of self reflection to know who you are as a leader." What drives your decisions as a leader and what are the lenses that you should be looking through as you make decisions both short term and long term to make sure that your behaviors match your beliefs. And so that's kind of where I found this article to be really, really helpful. Yeah, I I agree with that. I also think there's another process that happens when we are self-aware, meaning it's, it's, it's definitely that your behavior matches your beliefs, but also that you can predict your own behavior regardless of the scenario. I think that's really important too. And, you know, we talk about, you know, leadership theories in general, you know, we, we have guests on the show all the time, obviously, and we have people on the show that are authors that have, you know, they, they write books and they want to talk about their book and that's great. And, and we like having those people on. We also like having people on who've actually led people too. like, we want people who have actually done the job of leadership. And there's a, there's a balance at the beginning. I, I used to think, why would, why would we want to have somebody on who just talks about the theory of leadership if they haven't actually done it themselves, both is important. And there are a lot of people who are really good at articulating the theories of leadership and talking about the different theories. They're, they're experts in the human condition, but maybe they haven't led a lot of people in, in their own life. There are also a lot of really great leaders who, if you ask them what their leadership theory was, they'd look at you like you were talking a different language to them. They couldn't even articulate what their leadership theory was or why they do the things they do. They just talk about it and it's almost like second nature to them because it's part of who they are. But if you had to put them in a box of something, there'd be a theory or two or three that you could put them in and say, clearly, you're this type of leader, that type of leader, even if they couldn't articulate that themselves. And so it is definitely a both. It's a 
if you want to be a good leader, you have to you have to be the good leader first of all. But the self awareness of knowing what your your decisions and your behavior are rooted in can help you refine that. Can help you make it better. Can help it be less of a um, almost like oh that yes I did do that that was cool I didn't know I was going to do that to being much more intentional and much more. Um, predictive around what your uh, your response will be in a situation you've never encountered before, and that is power as a leader to know kind of like all right, what what instances could happen that might test my values as a leader, and I can put myself in those situations hypothetically in advance to to kind of play it out because if you if you decide in advance how you're going to act in a situation, it's much easier to hold yourself to that standard than it is to to potentially be kind of like uh, uh, encumbered by the the knee-jerk reaction that then you have to recover from. And so all these things are really important. So what I want to do is over the next eight episodes, I want to talk about a different theory of leadership from the monday.com article around the, the different theories of leadership. And I some of these I think are going to resonate really well with a lot of our listeners. Some of them you might hear and go like, mm, that's definitely not me. But that's a good thing too. You know, if you can dismiss some of them and say, that's not me, that's that's also a win, and so um, the the today we'll go up through the first one, which is um, on the Monday.com article. The first theory they talk about is the great man theory, and it is it's a theory that is um, there's a there's a root of it when it was created in a time when leaders were almost all men. Like there weren't a lot of women in leadership. There weren't a lot of women in the workplace, literally, let, um, let alone in leadership roles. And so the verbiage here might be um, something where you think about the verbiage and think that doesn't apply to me. It, I, I, when I read it, I tried to take myself out of that mindset of it being about the great man theory and I put myself in like the great person theory. And so, you know, based on what you read about it, what, what were your thoughts about the the great person theory? Let's put it. Yeah, well, I think it's it's one of those situations where, and we've talked about this as well on this show, where like the idea that leaders are born and not made. And, and that's kind of what comes out of the great person theory. And I think in the article itself, it states it is saying, and, and I'll change the, the verbiage now because it makes more sense. The great person theory suggests that leaders are born, not made. This theory believes that people are born with the inherent characteristics needed to lead. These traits include charisma, courage, intelligence, confidence, and excellent communication skills. Advocates of the theory look to famous figures such as Mahatma Gandhi as classic examples of this theory in action. Despite having no leadership training, Mahatma Gandhi took on a leadership role, and his nonviolent approach to political activism influenced millions. A popular theory in the 19th century, it now faces significant criticism for inferring that no real effort is required to become a leader and that leadership skills cannot be taught or improved upon. Some people also dislike that most characteristics are inherently masculine, which leaves less space for discussion of alternative leadership styles. So I think that that's what the article says, and I think it's a good kind of a good starting point to kind of discuss and break down some of the things that are brought up here. Yeah, so the, the two things that I took away from that that, that are, I, I don't want to say they're positive or negative but just kind of like the what what came into my head when I when I'm reading this and going through it and I did some other reading on these theories cuz these theories aren't weren't created by monday.com they, they if you you can you could google all of them and there's a lot of content around all of these that come up um the things that I think about is when it when it talks about the traits traits include charisma courage intelligence confidence and excellent communication skills well <clears throat> if you look at it in the context of men versus women I, I know plenty of both who have charisma, courage, intelligence, confidence, and excellent communication skills. The last one, the excellent communication skills, that is audience dependent, meaning <laughs> a person might have excellent communication skills with this group of people, but not resonate really well with that group of people because – now, does that mean they don't have excellent communication skills? No, it, it means that they, they work better in one environment versus another, and I think that if you if you look at it from that standpoint – Really what has changed over time is the types of ways people want to be communicated to. Like mm -hmm. as as an employee, how do I want my boss to communicate towards me? And and 50 years ago, a person might have communicated to somebody who reporting to them in a much different way than the way a boss would communicate to someone that was on their team today. And that might naturally 50 years ago have said that, oh, the, 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 the traits that we look at as inherently masculine, it might have favored those. Uh, but, you know, the, the way the workforce is now, I can't imagine many of those kind of really hard and fast, top down, blunt, 
you know, no empathy, those, the, the ways that people led 50 years ago, that wouldn't fly today. So I don't know that necessarily means that the traits have changed. I think it just means that people want to be communicated to differently. So that's, that's the first thing I think of. The second thing that I think of is that, you know, talks about Mahatma Gandhi having no leadership training, took on a leadership role. There's a, there's a saying I heard a long time ago, and that is uh, necessity is the mother of invention, right? Like if you, if you have no problem to solve, then you'll never, you couldn't possibly invent anything because you, you need to almost have something activate in you that says there's a, there's something greater at risk here if I don't solve this problem. And there are a lot of leaders who are kind of accidental leaders throughout history. People who would never have chosen to be leaders. They have no leadership training, but something awakened in them because the other op, the other option would be much worse in their mind and no one else was doing it. Like, if not me, then who kind of thing. And so I think there are a lot of leaders who we look back on as, as brilliant leaders, almost like, a, well, if they were a brilliant leader without any leadership training, then that means they're the real leaders. And, and someone who went through years and years of leadership training to be a good leader, they're somehow that they're lacking something that they, they should have been able to bring to the table, which is also completely you know false. Yeah, well, I, I see, I firmly believe that like leadership is influence. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I think over time, um, and we've talked about in the show before, like I think if you have siblings, right, if you're in different types of uh, of backgrounds or have experiences with family where you're where you're you know you're forced to kind of mature or grow older sooner if you have responsibilities as a child like there are things that uh, will shape some of these skills that are necessary to help to influence people and bring people along and and I think that that that's why I don't subscribe to the idea that leaders are necessarily born. I think there can be some things that will, from a societal standpoint, will put you in a place uh, of of you know whether it's you know respect because of uh, of of the family that you come from or your social status or whatever the case is that may influence people's willingness to want to listen to you. Uh, but I I think longer term is as as you grow up you you learn skills and competence to influence people and i think that's why you see these elements where somebody says they have no leadership training but they became a great leader i think they were influencing people at a young age and and right. their 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 magnetic personality or their their the people want to follow somebody who believes in something and so like there are things that happen that if you are focused and committed and and this is how you see the world and this is what you want to do and this is what you believe is the right thing to do and you say that out loud I think people are attracted to that. And then somebody from the outsider looking in says, well, that's a leader. Look at those people that are following that person um, right. for whatever the reason is. So I, I just think that there is so much of, uh, of this idea where there are things that you being born may give you an advantage of having influence other people, uh, having influence over other people. But I think there are factors in life that give you these skills, whether again, by choice or by force, where you just have to deal with it and figure it out. But having that natural organic influence over people, um, I think is very helpful in some instances. But then we also know that there are people that have started cults and done some really bad things with that level of influence. But at the end of the day, for me, over time, that's what this is all about. And I think that you can sharpen skills and you can become a better communicator and you can learn leadership elements that will be helpful in in how you influence people and bring them forward a little bit more effective, a little bit more efficiently. Um, but I, I have a hard time saying no, just by definition, if you are born a leader or you're not born a leader, um, I, I think I think a lot of it has to do more with environment um, than it does necessarily just just birth. I like a couple of things there. First of all, I agree leadership is influence, and it, it could be that uh, I I have influence over people because the family that I come from has a ton of money, and there are a lot of people who really want to be at the table with me. And so they will tolerate my poor leadership in <laughs> order to be at that table. Now, that's influence, but clearly that's not leadership. So leadership is influence, but, but as time goes on and as priorities change, I think that it, it's not about influence to get people to do what you want them to do. It's influence to get people to do something that they – inherently wanted to do anyway and now will do at the highest level that they're capable of doing because they want to be there not because they feel like they have no choice but to be there and and so the the 
the kind of in, increase at, of visibility around different work environments that and, and the people not caring about staying at the same company for 30 years, all those things have reprioritized people's kind of mindset around what they will and will not tolerate. So I'm hoping it, it continues and I'm hoping that over time we'll see even less of an impact on I have influence because of who I am or who I was born as and more of a I have influence because people gravitate towards me. I also hear a lot of a lot of learning here. And so the example of like you 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 get trained through your environment over time. Um you know if if you have to touch the hot stove a hundred times to learn you shouldn't touch a hot stove, you're probably not long for this world, right? <laughs> um, but but someone who realizes very early on that when they were six years old, that they had to get their younger brother or sister to do what they, to, to eat dinner because both parents were out of the house working and they had to kind of like take care of the younger siblings that it didn't do any good to yell and scream and slap them and, and try to shove food down their throat, that it, it was better to to do other things, to say like, oh, fine, I'm going to go enjoy my food by myself over here and, and make them want to be part of the club, want to be part of that, you know, I'm going to go sit with my brother or sister, I want to eat with them. The, the things that they were able to do to get the behavior that they were looking for, if you learn that more quickly, then you start to, even if you don't realize it's happening, it's happening in you. You're, 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 you're being taught or you're teaching yourself that, oh, there are ways to get things done in a way that makes people not even realize that, that you, um, I don't want to say, you know, psychologically tricked them, but it's not, it's not about trickery. It's about just getting the right outcome that is best for everybody in a way that makes people want to be there voluntarily. People who learn that more quickly and earlier in their life, they definitely, um, tend to come off as better leaders, but it doesn't mean they didn't have any formal tra- they didn't have any training. They didn't just sit in a classroom, but they had training. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you a question. When you think back on just growing up and in your professional career, was there was there a moment for you when when something happened where you kind of realized that that this is a leadership moment more than it is like influence or to your point like trickery because you know, if you if you've got siblings you kind of know what motivates them demotivates them you kind of know what you can do to to you know sure. to make them do things they don't want to do to get things done but was there a point where you were like oh man like 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 th- this is about like le- like there's a responsibility to this influence more than just somebody doing something I want them to do. Yeah, absolutely. So so I am kind of looked at in my family as the the mediator um, when it comes to other people in my family, and and it was not something intentional. It it came about because I don't repeat anything. If if any of my siblings tells me something, vents to me about another sibling, vents to me about our parents, vents to about anything at all. I'll just, I'll, I'll listen. I, I'll participate. I'll, I'll go back and forth. I, I won't say anything I don't actually believe to make it seem like I have solidarity with them. I, I won't like compromise that, but I also don't repeat anything ever. Like no one else will know that we ever had that conversation. And my desire to do that at the beginning was always just because I didn't want to be a part of the drama. I, I didn't want to be the the one who spread the news like the like you know like a, a high school quad. Um, I just wanted to kind of like take it and move on. What happened over time is that more and more people in my family would vent to me about other people in the family, and so I have this kind of this kind of vast uh, encyclopedia of of knowledge of a of a lot of people that will just never that will just never leave me. And I've taken that in my to my in my leadership career to to where when an employee tells me something, it never gets repeated also. And I think a lot of people just want to be heard. They just they want to feel like somebody heard them without feeling like that they're risking something by sharing it. And 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 that has earned me a lot of influence with a lot of people just because they know they can trust me. And 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 it it was many years ago but way after i was doing it repeatedly that i realized that they are that they are related that part of the reason i have influence as a leader is because of that skill that i kind of accidentally learned growing up in a family where there's a lot of drama in my family and there's a, there's a lot of uh, emotional people and knee jerk reactions and and I, I have to be a mediator sometimes absolutely and that's a family right <laughs> and with that it brings us to this episode's one minute hack but first a few words from our sponsors The One Minute Hack. 
All right, for this episode's One Minute Hack, here's what I want you to do. Get out your pen and paper, and I want you to write down things that you believe give you influence as a leader. It could be something that is a, a, a skill that you think you naturally have. It could be a skill that you that you learned, that you read somewhere, and that you that resonated with you. But if people follow you and look at you as a good leader or a positive leader in their life, why is that? What is it that you bring that, that gives you that? Write those things down, and then I want you to look at what you can do to be intentional around those things so they don't happen accidentally. So it's not just something you look back on and think, oh, that worked out well because I did this. And instead it's, I know these are the tools and skills I have in my tool bag. I'm going to intentionally use them going forward to make sure that I have influence in areas that will benefit the people who who report to me, that benefit myself as a leader, uh, my organization, that get people where they wanna go and help them accomplish their goals. Being intentional about these things will help you kind of harness the influence that you have and, and do more with it. And, and I think too, it's like one of those situations where the self-awareness piece of all of these things, and again, the intent of these eight episodes is to really kind of talk about these different leadership theories um, and take a moment to, to consider um, what are they? Um, do, do they exist for you? Do you see them that way? Maybe maybe they do, but you're not even aware of them. But taking the moment to really think about them, to, to, to reflect upon how do I utilize this to to, to continue to have, you know, a positive influence uh, around people that I lead or to refine skills that are there that, that somebody would just say, oh, like, that's just Chris. Well, it, it, it may be just Chris, but if Chris understands what he can do with that type of skill um, and become better at it, not only in implementation, but in teaching it or using it to help develop people that need that type of skill, it's very, very powerful at that point. Right, right. I, I, I kind of think about uh, the this process as almost like the um, – the X Men school, where the the mutants go as children, who are just they're they're they don't know what their powers can do or if they can hurt or help people, but they're they're there to learn how to do good with them and to make sure that they don't do bad with them. This is exactly what this is: being able to kind of know who you are and where you come from, and the things that you're naturally inclined to do, the skills that you have, knowing how to harness those in the right way is, is always a positive. We will link to this article in the um, podcast description for the next eight episodes. If you want to read ahead and see the um, the other ones, feel free to. Um, but we hope you join us uh, for, the, for the next eight episodes on each one of these different theories. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us to the end of this episode. This is Hacking Leadership School for the Gifted. I'm Lorenzo. <laughs> and I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you all next time. <laughs>